Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. Hey church! Good evening! Hey everybody, stay standing because I'm going to pray. I don't know what I enjoyed more. Pastor Jim in this great form he was in tonight or Pastor Debbie's comments from the peanut gallery. It was absolutely amazing. So anyway, uh, you guys are amazing. I just love you. I love you so much. You know, I, I, he wasn't going to get up here tonight, and I love Pastor Luke and Pastor Dan. I think it was Pastor Dan was going to come up. I said, Jim, I am not leaving here without you getting up there, because I knew he would be sarcastic, and I love his sarcasm. So anyway... <laughs> I think, you know, to be honest with you, I think Jesus enjoys his sarcasm. So, you know, you know the Lord said that to my one, wife one time? He said, Lisa, I really think you're funny. Because her, anyway, my wife is hilarious. She and Jim have similar personalities. But anyway, it's great to be back tonight. I absolutely love you guys. I've had such a wonderful weekend with you. Thank you for the way you love God so much. And I, I got to make sure I'm talking to everybody I've already talked to. How many of you... Well, let's say it like this. How many of you weren't in any of the services yet? This is the first time you're here. Let me see your hands. Hey, yeah, yeah. So we got a bunch of new people tonight. Well, then, of course, I have to show you the picture of my family, right? Now, now let me say this. Right, we're going to put the picture of my family up here. Okay, first of all, I am family around here, okay, not guest speaker. I love this house. I've been coming for years. So you got Uncle John in the house tonight. So get rid of all the guest speaker stuff, all right? But here is my family, and that is my beautiful wife of 32 years of marriage this year. She just landed in St. Louis where she's going to be on Joyce's programs uh, tomorrow. And then on the left is my oldest son, Addison. He is all the good and all the good of John and Lisa put together and none of the bad of John or Lisa put in there. So he is an amazing man. That's his wife, Juliana. And then the three on the right are available. I would like a you know, Southern California daughter-in-law. Austin graduated summa cum laude from University of Colorado. What does that mean? I have no idea. It just means he's a whole lot smarter than me. And so he just landed in Thailand where he's going over to check out the uh, work that we've been doing to get girls out of sex trafficking over there in Thailand and in India and uh, Cambodia, or, uh, Cambodia. And then we have Alec. Alec is our out of the box child. He wiped out on his mother's ninja motorcycle going over 60 miles an hour a few months back. Uh, he completely totaled the bike. He walked away without a scratch. And uh, he texted me, he texted me the next day and he said, Dad, the reason I didn't get a scratch is I wrote a covenant of protection with God. I texted him back and said, I'm so glad you wrote the covenant of protection, but the bike is gone. And so there was three motorcycles in the Bevere house. There are no more. And then we've got Arden at the end. He is an amazing young man. He's a golfer. He's interning at uh, Steve Kelly's church, Wave Church in Virginia Beach. And then the two little ones, those are my G-babies. You see, now what's a G-baby? I'm way too young to be grandpa, so it is G-daddy and G for short. So here is Asher. He is absolutely adorable. He turns five this year, and this is Sophia Grace. And as I said all weekend, Sophia is the first girl born in the entire Bavir or Toscano clan since 1967. So this is really one celebrated little girl. Now she has me completely wrapped around her little finger. I adore this girl. And I'm going to show you, would you, like, would you like me to preach better tonight? Okay, would you like that? So can you give me 15 seconds? Because if I see 15 seconds of a video of her worshiping God, I'll do better. Would you like that? Okay, so I'm going to show you 15 seconds. You know this is the New Hill song. Watch this. <laughs> I am in love with that girl. So anyway, that's my family, and the more I love my family, the more I realize how much God loves all of us because we're his family. Can you say amen? Amen. amen? amen. Well, this is kind of a bittersweet service for me because I've just loved being with you guys all weekend. Thank you for your passion. Thank you for all you're doing to help this community. 
bringing light into this community, hope into this community, the way you care for this community, the way you're sacrificially giving to pay this building off, please get that done. It's so wonderful when the house of God is debt free. And so, you know, join together. And you know what? When you give, let me tell you something, you can never outgive God. Because when the seed leaves your hand, it doesn't leave your life. Okay? It just, Jesus is the one, no preacher is the one that said, he said, when you give, it will be given back unto you again. So please get behind the stewardship campaign. Be a part of it. If everybody just does their part in the book of Exodus, it said the day came when Moses had to say, stop giving. I mean, man, we got more than enough to build the house of God. And so I just believe one day Papa Jim's going to stand up here and say, stop giving. We got it paid off. We got it done. Amen. Amen. That's the way God does it. So get behind what the house is doing. Get your heart in what the house is doing. And let's get this job done. Amen. Amen. Now, I'm going to ask you again. I've asked you all day. Do you want a message from me tonight or do you want your life changed forever? You guys are smart, so that's what we're going to ask God for tonight, all right? So let's pray. I really sense something special for tonight. So Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we are so grateful for what you've already done, but I'm reminded that you always save the best wine for last, and this is the final service of this weekend. And so I'm asking once again, Holy Spirit, that you would literally invade this sanctuary. That Lord, every single person under the sound of my voice would see and behold Jesus, in a manner and a way like we have never seen him before. And as we behold him, that we would go from glory to glory as by the spirit of the living God. For again, tonight I decree, your kingdom has come within us. Your will shall be done in this place on earth as it is in heaven. So Father, I'm asking tonight that you would not only give me your word, but your heart to deliver it. Let it be as if Jesus was standing here speaking to us himself. And I'm asking that as this is accomplished, that, Lord, not one person, not one household under the sound of my voice will ever be the same again. You can do this. We believe you for it. We ask you for it. And we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' mighty, wonderful, majestic, holy, awesome, magnificent name. And everybody that agrees shouts. Yeah. Come on, give him praise for what he's going to do. Amen. You can be seated. All right. Tonight, I'm going to share with you out of a book that I wrote called Relentless. Everybody shout Relentless. Yeah. The power you need to never give up. Now, to open this tonight, I'm going to share a scripture that I do not hear people quoting quite often. Matter of fact, I don't hear it at all. I don't hear people preaching on this scripture very often. But I find this to be an amazing scripture in the word of God. And it is Paul's words to the Philippian church in the 29th verse of the first chapter. Paul says, for to you, it has been granted on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. Now, this just doesn't sit right with me. For to you, it is granted Okay, I'm thinking, what promise is he about to elaborate on? And he goes on to say to suffer for his sake? Come on. That's like looking at somebody and saying, for to you, it is granted on your birthday to go to the dentist and get a root canal. That's about what it sounds like here, okay? I mean, can I just, all right, come on. Let me just do a little survey in here tonight. How many of you have gone through extreme hardship or adversity in your life? Can I see a show of hands? All right, question. Did you like it? All right. Did you feel like it was granted to you or more like it was inflicted upon you? <laughs> inflicted, right? I mean, can I just go through some of the thoughts maybe that we go through when we go through sudden adversity and hardship? Now, I know we would never say these words because we've been trained so well, but I'm telling you, some of us fight these thoughts. I can't believe this is happening. Or why me? Or why do I have to go through this? Or here's a blunt one. I hate this. Or no one can relate to what I'm going through. And this has got to be my favorite. Why can't I just have a normal life? God, please take this away. Why bother? Giving up would be so much easier. Now, if you had some of these thoughts, can I tell you something? You're not alone. There are a whole lot of other Christians that have had these thoughts when facing sudden adversity or extreme hardship. In fact, the Apostle Paul had some of these thoughts. 
but he had what I like to call a paradigm shift. Now, what is a paradigm shift? I know it's a really ancient word, but I still like it. It is a radical change from one way of thinking to another. And if you listen to what God has commanded me to bring to you tonight, I believe you also will have a paradigm shift when it comes to facing sudden adversity and hardship. Would you like that? All right, then let me establish what I'm going to say tonight with a lot of scripture right up front. First of all, let me go to what Peter says on the exact same subject. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, he says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. Everybody say, arm yourselves. Arm yourselves. Say it again. Arm say it one more time. Arm also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now look at his words, arm yourself. Can you imagine a nation sending its military into battle like we did with our boys and girls in Iraq a few years ago. And when we send our military into battle, we give them no guns, no bullets, no knives, no tanks, no rocket launchers, no ships, no planes, no arms at all. Can you imagine such a ridiculous scenario? I mean, would that military conquer? No way. Would they even contend? Not hardly. They would be defeated probably in a single day. Well, as ridiculous as that sounds to you, that is equally ridiculous as a Christian not being armed to suffer. Yet most Western Christians are unarmed. Because when sudden adversity or hardship hits our lives, because we're unprepared, we go into a state of shock, bewilderment, amazement. And out of that state of shock, bewilderment, or amazement, we react instead of act. Let me give you an example of somebody who's armed and somebody who's not armed. Commercial airline pilots. Every six months, a commercial airline pilot has to go for recurrent training. What is recurrent training? A big part of it is they put these pilots into a flight simulator for a couple days. What's a flight simulator? It's basically a perfectly replicated co cockpit of the exact plane they fly. It's a massive computer system. It's got a visualization system on it, and it's all mounted on motion platforms. To put it real simple, when you're in the sim, you can't tell if you're in the sim or the real plane, it's that realistic. And what they do is they throw every adversity they know that can hit a pilot in that simulator. Anything from extreme wind shear, a loss of a landing gear, a loss of an engine, to even a loss of total power, to extreme turbulence. And what happens is those pilots may crash a time or two in that simulator, but then they start getting it. And they start getting through these adverse circumstances in that sim. And what the FAA tells us is that many commercial aviation disasters have been avoided because of the pilot's training in the simulator. There is actually a flight on record that happened before 9-11-2001. Do you remember back in the days when the small commuter planes used to have no doors between the pilots and the passengers? I mean, you don't have that anymore today after 9-11. But back in those days, it was like that, the smaller planes. One of those commuter planes took off and it crashed and it killed everybody on board. When the FAA recovered the black box, they noticed something very interesting. When the disaster hit, the pilots went into action immediately. Senior pilot was like, pull up on the flaps, check. Co-pilot, senior pilot was like, feather the engines, check. Let down the landing gear, check. And these guys did this all the way to the crash. On the other hand, they could also, on the black box here, the passengers, because there was no door. And when the situation hit, the passengers went into hysteria. They were screaming. So here's the pilots acting and the passengers reacting. Why? Because the pilots were armed, the passengers were unarmed. If you listen carefully to what I'm going to bring you tonight, the Word of God, I believe this will be like your simulator. You're going to be armed when it comes to sudden adversity and hardship. Would you like that? Yes. Amen. You would like that? Then let's start. Number one, in order to be armed, you must know that adversity is going to happen. 
It is inevitable. Jesus says in John 16, in this world, you will. He doesn't say you might. He doesn't say it's a good probability. He said you are going to have tribulation. What is the Greek word tribulation? It is the Greek word thalipsis. It is basically defined as this great emotional or spiritual stress that can be caused by external or internal pressures. Paul comes along and affirms what Jesus says in Acts chapter 14 by saying we must through many tribulations, Greek word thalipsis, enter the kingdom of heaven. So, number one, not only is it going to happen, but you're going to face many. So that's the first thing you got to understand in order to be armed. It's going to happen. Number two, in order to be armed, you must know that you absolutely have the strength to overcome whatever it is you're facing. One of my favorite personal scriptures in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Paul says, God keeps his promise. Can you say amen to that? The specific promise that he is talking about here is he will not allow. Everybody say allow. allow. Say it again. Allow. Say it again. Allow. allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm. You know what that means? Whatever it is you're facing right now, real time, you got the power to get through it and get through it successfully. That is God's promise to you. I don't know about you, but that really excites me right there. Now notice the word allow. The first thing we've got to understand if we're really going to be successful when it comes to facing adversity is this. That God is not the author or the instigator of the evil hardship you're facing. James comes along and says, hey, don't be deceived. Now there's only one problem with deception. And that's this, it's deceiving. The person who's deceived believes with all their heart what they believe is right when in reality they're wrong. That's scary. James says, if you want to stay away from deception, you better get this through your head, through your heart, and get it really firm. And that is this. God is impervious to evil, and he puts evil in no one's way. That's James 1.13, okay? So God's not the author or the instigator of the hardship you're going through. Who's behind it? It's either a direct attack of Satan, or it's the consequences of a fallen world. Why does God allow it? To give you the opportunity to beat up on the enemy with the same freedom of your will that caused you to succumb to him in the first place, thus making his defeat a whole lot more bitter. Because let me tell you something, it's an unfair fight. No, some of you didn't hear me, what I just said. I said it's an unfair fight. Because, you know, Jesus said in Luke 10, 19, look at this. He said, listen, with an exclamation point. Now, listen, can I say something? I do tend to pay a little more attention to the words in red. But when the words in red say, listen, with an exclamation point, I mean, do you understand how important it is what he's about to say? So Jesus goes, listen, with an exclamation point. Okay, what are you saying listen to so firmly? You understand? I have given you authority, power. So that you can overcome all, not most, not 99.8%, all the power of the enemy. And nothing will hurt you. I don't know about you, but that really excites me. Do you understand those words are more real than the chair you're sitting on? Because those words create the material in the chair you're sitting on. This is why the Apostle Paul comes along and prays for us and says, I pray that you might know, listen to these words, and understand what is the immeasurable. Listen to this word, immeasurable. You cannot measure it. And unlimited. It's got no limits. And surpassing greatness of his power. Now, if he stopped right there, we'd go, oh, yeah, Jesus' power, it's immeasurable. Yes, it is beyond all limits. Yes, there's nothing else in the universe like it. But can you please read this verse in context? Of his power in, everybody point your finger and say, in, in. and for us. for us. 
Who believes? <laughs> okay, did you get that? There's the key, believe. I said, there's the key, believe. Two years ago this month, actually it was two years ago last month, I'm in Hawaii. And I'm doing a conference there, statewide conference. It's a great time to be in Hawaii, January, okay? And uh, I'm the Friday night speaker. Pastors are there from all over the state. I get done speaking. I'm walking out of the auditorium. And I tell you, I get stopped in the aisle by this woman who's standing like this next to her husband and their 12-year-old son. And she's like communicating to me, you're not getting by me. <laughs> and so I walk up. And well, it turns out he's a senior pastor. And she's the senior pastor's wife, right? She stops me and goes, Mr. Bevere, Mr. Bevere, my husband is a changed man. My husband doesn't preach the same. He doesn't pray the same. He doesn't lead us the same. And she whips out this x-ray. And she goes, this is an x-ray of a normal eye, of a normal eye. I'm going, okay, okay. Then she whips out another x-ray. She goes, this is an x-ray of my 12-year-old son standing right next to her. My 12-year-old son's eye last month. Well, in this x-ray, is all this black stuff behind his eye. I said, what's all that black stuff? She gives me the 15-letter medical term. And basically, it is a very rare degenerative eye nerve disease that was causing him to go blind permanently and rapidly. And they didn't know how to fix it. There's, there's not a cure. So she said, John, my husband and I were praying every day. We were fasting. Our entire church is praying for our 12-year-old son. She said, then last month, my husband got a hold of your book, Relentless, and he started walking through it in his morning devotions. She said, one morning, my husband comes bursting out of his study, and he said, honey, we've been doing this all wrong. We keep asking God to give us what he's already given us. You see, Jesus never asked God to heal an eye. He never asked God to heal one ear. He never asked God to heal a leg. He never asked God to stop the wind. He spoke to the eye. He spoke to the leg. He spoke to the ear. He spoke to the wind. The apostles in the book of Acts never asked God to heal a leg. They spoke to the leg in the name of Jesus. So she said, John, we stopped asking God to heal our son's eye. And we started speaking to it in the name of Jesus. She said, John, we went to our monthly doctor appointment today. This is amazing. She said, we go to the lab, normal protocol, they do the x-rays. We go over to the doctor's office. We wait, we go into the doctor's office, he comes in, he says, they messed up in the lab. You gotta go over and do it again. She said, we went back to the lab, they took a second set of x-rays. We go back to the doctor's office. The doctor comes in. He says, I don't know what they're doing over there. They messed up again. You got to go back and do it again. She says, we go back to the third time. Get the third set of x-rays. We come back. The doctor comes in. His face is white. And he goes, I don't get it. Your son's eye is perfectly normal. What is the immeasurable unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe you know what i was in hawaii in a conference last month there they were again Your son's 14 years old his eyes are perfect and they gave me the x-rays i've got them <laughs> number three in order to be armed you must know you never have to lose the Apostle Paul went through more adversity than he had ever faced in his life in Asia. He writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said it was so bad they thought they weren't going to live through it. But he comes to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, the next chapter, and he says, Now thanks be to God, who always, not most of the time, always causes us or leads us to triumph in Christ. You never have to lose. I'm preaching myself happy tonight. All right, number four. I don't know if you came here for you, but I came, I came here and I'm getting ministered to. Number four, you must. Now, here's the final point. This is my last point. You must embrace a positive attitude toward adversity. You know, James the Apostle, he's actually a pastor of the church in Jerusalem, writes, and he says, my beloved brethren, count it all joy 
When do we count it all joy? When you go through extreme adversity and sudden hardship. Now, can I really be honest with you? I don't talk like this. I don't say all joy. So I had to look this up. And I had to figure out what is he saying. Do you know what he's really saying? He's saying 100 part out of 100 parts in your heart needs to be joy. Not 99 part joy, one part sorrow. Why? Because a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. You could have 99 links of joy, but if you have one link of sorrow in your heart, that's how weak you are because the joy of the Lord is your strength, not the sorrow of the Lord. Okay? You with me? But the New Living Translation, Rick Renner tells me is the most accurate, brings it to a whole nother level. Because look what the New Living Translation says. Look at this. Look, look at this. No, no, guys, that's not it. James is this, this verse. I skipped all of this because they told me I could preach all night, but I actually don't really want to. Okay. <laughs> Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Opportunity. Opportunity. Okay, we know what, op we're Americans. We understand opportunity, right? We understand that, right? What, what's the opportunity? We go through sudden adversity and hardship, and James says, consider it an opportunity. What's the opportunity? He goes on to tell us. He says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance is has a chance to grow. What's the opportunity? You get a chance to grow your endurance. Now, what is endurance? Let's, let's talk about this word endurance, okay? Right now, we're going, uh, we got the, uh, the Winter Olympics going on, correct? Right? So you hear this word a lot, endurance training. What is endurance training? It is the deliberate act of exercising to increase your stamina. Simply put, endurance training increases your capacity. Everybody say capacity. capacity. To handle future challenges. Okay, now, everybody look up at me. I've said so much. Just look up at me. The adversities that God allows in our lives, they have a design about them. What's the design? To produce capacity. Greater capacity. Potential ability. God will permit a hardship today that simulates, remember the flight simulator? The levels of pressure we're going to face tomorrow because I know he knows our end from the beginning. That's why a trial always feels greater than your present level of responsibility. Simply put, God is using your present challenges to strengthen you for greater conquests in your future. <laughs> Are you kidding this? Okay, it's kind of like weightlifting. Everybody say weightlifting. Okay, so I'm 35 years old. We're going back a few years, all right? 20 years from now, okay? <laughs> because I'm turned 55 this year. So I'm 35 years old and I'm traveling all over the country. I've been doing it for five years. And I'm standing on a platform in Atlanta and I see stars, I almost faint. Because back then, I saw going to the gym as a complete, total waste of time. I was way too busy with the ministry. And so I'm standing on this platform in Atlanta and I almost faint. And I weighed like 10 pounds less than what I weigh right now, right? I was like skin and bones. So I come home, I look at my wife, I said, baby, I gotta go to the gym. She said, thank God I've been praying you'd go to the gym. I said, are you serious? Now, my next door neighbor was a WWF wrestler, and he was one of their big boys. He was making seven digits a year with them, okay? And he and I, our families were very, very close, okay? His wife got saved. His kids got saved. He's another story, but anyway. Um, we used to play, you know, street hockey and all this stuff with our boys, basketball. We'd golf together, and, and he was constantly saying to me, John, let me take you to the gym and train you. I said, his name was Kip. I said, Kip, I don't have time for that. Well, when this situation happened, I go over to his house and I knock on his door and he comes to the door. You know, he always came to the door like this because the guy's six foot four. He weighs 240 pounds. He's 4% body fat. He's got a perfect V chest, perfect A pack, and his arms are as big as my legs right there. Okay, so he's standing there looking at me. I said, Kip, you told me you wanted to bring me to the gym. I now want to go to the gym. 
So he looks at me with a sadistic smile and he goes, I'll take you to the gym. <laughs> so the next day, we go to the sweat box of a gym and all of his training buddies are there. Well, I feel like the midget in the land of the giants. These guys are huge, right? And so the first day, I mean, get Larry, they made you look little, okay? So the first day I'm in the gym, I learned something. And this is what I learned. You don't build muscle by putting light weight on the bar and going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. God, stop now. That's not the way you build muscle. You put heavy weight on the bar so that you can only lift it up three times. But after the third rep, that's when all the fun begins. Because that's when your body starts like shaking violently. <laughs> your face goes different shades of red. Blood vessels now appear on your forehead and on your neck and all the monsters around your bench are screaming at you going, push! And something on the inside of you pushes up the fourth time. That's when muscle begins to develop. That's the simplified version, okay? So, um, please don't laugh. The first time in the gym, the most I could push up was 95 pounds, okay? Thank you for not laughing. So, I was so excited. You know, I'm working out, pushing up 95. Well, after a couple months, I pushed up 105. A few months later, 115. A few months later, 125. And after eight months, I pushed up 135. I got a plate on both sides. I can hold my head up a little bit in the gym now, right? And so we keep working. We get up to 145, 155, 165, 175, 185. I finally make it to 205, and I'm stuck there for like five years. So I'm really frustrated because I can't get 225 up. Well, I go preach in Fresno, California at a conference, right? And these, all these preachers there are weightlifters. And they said, Bevere, let's go to the gym. I said, sure. So they said, Bevere, what's the most you've ever pushed up? I said, 205. They said, you're going to do 225 today. I said, I've been trying, man, for five years. They said, hey, we're going to spot you. You're going to do it. And I pushed up 225 that day. So then I hire this guy on my staff. He used to be a weightlifter, and a competitive weightlifter. And he and I start working out. Well, I push up 235. And one time I get up 245. So I fly to this church in Detroit. And I preach all day Sunday. And the pastor looks at me. And the pastor says, hey, I got a nationally renowned weightlifting coach in my church. I mean, he's produced champions. He trains me Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Do you want to go to my session tomorrow? I said, do I ever? So me and my employee that was the bodybuilder, we go to this guy's gym. And the guy looks me up and down. He asks me a few questions. He says, so, the most you've ever pushed up is 245. I said, yeah, man, but it's one time. He goes, let's see what we can do today. So he gets me, teaches me the technique. We do this, and I push up 265. I'm like, whoa, I'm so excited. So this guy looks at me and goes, Bevere, I'm going to coach you on email. Every week I'm going to send you a new training thing, and I want you and your employee to do this. I said, yeah, man, I'll do it. And he said, when you come back to our church next year, let's see what we can do. So we do this religiously. Now I'm 40, 42 years old, right? The next year I come back to the church. And I preach all day Sunday on the Holy Spirit. All day, morning and night. I walk into the guy's gym on Monday morning. He looks at me, <laughs> the coach. He goes, Bevere, I had a dream last night. You pushed up 315 pounds. I said, you're crazy. I weigh 175 pounds. He said, Bevere, you preached on the Holy Spirit all day yesterday. I had a dream last night. Shut up and get down there. You're doing this. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's what he said. So I get down there. We warm up. And sure enough, that day, I pushed up 315 pounds. I called my wife from the Detroit airport. I said, baby, I don't even think I need a plane to get home. I am so high right now. <laughs> okay? So now let me say something. I've said all this to say this. When I pushed 315 pounds up when I, at the age of 42 years old, right? 225 is now routine. I'm pushing up 225 10 times. Now what would have happened if Kip would have put 225 on that bar the first time in the gym when I was 35? I'll tell you what would have happened. The bar would have come down the speed of gravity, would have busted <laughs> open my chest, fatally wounded me and killed me. So, what was now routine would have killed me when I first began. All right, so let me take you back on another little story here. I'm 24 years old. I'm working for Rockwell International as head mechanical engineer. I've got a mechanical engineering degree from Purdue University, 
I get promoted to being head mechanical engineer on a Takamo project, which is a naval project that they're doing. And I'm over a multi-million dollar project and I'm making a lot of money as a mechanical engineer at 24 years of age for Rockwell, all right? So I'm making all this money and I'm spending it like crazy, right? Well, then my pastor comes to me and my pastor looks at me and says, this is an 8,000 member church. And he says, John, I want you to come and be my wife's and my personal assistant, but we can only pay you $18,000 a year. Now that was a huge pay cut. I mean, massive pay cut, okay? But I came home, talked to my wife, we prayed about it, we figured it out, $18,000 a year salary, we could basically pay our bills, have a little bit of money left over for food. That's it, no money for anything else. But we didn't care, God put it in our heart to do it, so we accepted the job. So I'm gonna work for them. And now, what I used to not even think about in buying, I mean, I was having to fight for in prayer. I was having to fight in prayer just to buy a pair of socks, a pair of jeans. I was having to fight just to buy a Christmas gift. And how many of you know your unsaved loved ones don't understand when you don't give them a Christmas gift, right? And I remember one time, Lisa and I had to make the decision, were we gonna give our tithe or buy groceries? I'm not kidding. For us, it wasn't a decision. Jesus is our Lord, what decision is there? We gave our tithe and we sat in the car after service and cried. <laughs> Why? Because I'm not getting paid for 10 days and I have $5 to our name and we need groceries. Now, why were we in that situation? Well, we had one car and I'm driving the church van, right? Well, I come home from work one day and the rear tire is flat and I don't have a spare because I inherited this car from my wife when I married her and she didn't have a spare. So I'm like, got a flat rear tire with no spare. That's not a good thing. And I'm so tired, I think I'll deal with it tomorrow. Well, I come home the next day, I try to start the car. Don't even ask me what I'm thinking. What are you gonna do if you start it? But anyway, the car won't start. I lift up the hood because I got a dead alternator. So now I got a dead alternator, a dead, a flat tire, and I got no money, okay? So I'm calling garages and I can't find anybody who can fix it for what I've got. So I think, leave it alone. I don't wanna deal with this now. So about five days later, I come home from in the van and I look over and it's a two door Thunderbird. The whole window is busted and it wasn't vandalism. It was so hot that summer that the window exploded. So I'm cleaning up all this glass and I get a black hefty trash can and some duct tape and I make a makeshift window and I'm lying in bed that night and I think all we need is one good thunderstorm and my makeshift window's blowing in, water's pouring into my car, the car's gonna rot, the apartment complex is gonna be on my case, I'm getting angry. So the next day I went out and found a place where nobody could hear me. And this is exactly what I said. I said, all right, devil, it is a fight you want, it is a fight you are about to have. I have a sword and you don't. So I'm going to take the sword of the word of God and I'm going to cut you up into pieces. And if you don't flee from me, I will cut your pieces into pieces. My God shall supply my need according to his riches and glory. And I start speaking the word. Well, I feel this release. I'm like, okay, something happened. So the next day, my wife has a girlfriend come over for lunch. So she comes into our apartment. She, she can't miss our car, it's an eyesore. She goes, Lisa, isn't that your and John's car out there? She goes, yeah, that's our car. She goes, I got a friend that's a mechanic. The guy comes over and fixes everything for practically nothing. So God gets us out again. So a few months later, my wife looks at me. She says, honey, I wanna have babies. I said, I do too. She said, we can't have babies in this apartment complex because it's adult only. And there's no apartment complexes that are decent enough where we can have children in this whole area we live in. So we gotta buy a house. I said, you're right, we gotta buy a house. So we search all over the area. And the cheapest cookie cutter house we can find, you have to put $5,000 down. Well, the most we had ever saved as a married couple was $1,800 and we had that right then. Most of it left over from engineering days. And so we figured it out. If we really save and we eat a lot of potatoes and tuna fish, we will get $5,000 in a couple years. So we start saving. Well, the next Sunday, I walk into church and my pastor 
taking a heart for the house offering, right? Special outreach for, for the local church, right? And I turned to my wife in the service and said, I think we're supposed to give $1,000. She said, we'll talk when we get home. <laughs> so that afternoon, we go back to our apartment. She said, honey, we need a house. We've already figured out how to save. If we give 1000 our $1,800 goes down to 800 I said, baby, I know it doesn't make a lick of sense, but I believe we're supposed to sow the seed. She said, okay, I'm with you. So we sow the $1,000. Now, I'm not going to take the time to tell you the stories, but they are good. But I don't, really don't want you here all night. But within three months, three different parties who had no idea we needed money ended up giving us the money, and we moved into our house three months later. Now, the whole problem was <laughs> we had no furniture. <laughs> you walk into our house. It's a great room. You know, you got the, <laughs> the, the family room, the dining room, right? There's no kitchen, there's no dining room table, there is no couches, there's nothing on the walls, there's no headboard for our master bed, there's nothing. The house is empty. And we got no money. All right? Now, there was a couple in our church that <laughs> he owned a business, and his tithe one Sunday was $750,000. His company made $7.5 million then, right? I saw the check. Well, his wife decides she's going to change all the furniture in her house. So if you're going to change all the furniture in your house, you've got to get rid of your existing furniture, right? So you know where this is going, right? No, you don't. She gives all the furniture to the couple's pastors. Now, we're the youth pastors. Now, the couple's pastors already had a house and already had it filled with furniture. My wife was livid. She was like... They gave the money to the wrong people. That's our furniture. They've got furniture. We've got nothing. Now, you have to understand something. My wife is Sicilian and Apache Indian. Okay? They stole my land and I'm mafia. I was born ticked off. You understand? Okay? So I made sure, I made sure, I'm very calculated on this move. I made sure I made this comment as I was walking out the door to a service. I said, it is your fault we don't have furniture. Oh my gosh, I'll never forget this. Hands on the hip. What? Smoke in the eyes, okay? Hatchet is coming out. And I'm like, and she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, we had an agreement. I believe God for the house. You believe God to fill it. I've done my job. You haven't done your job. That is like stupidity 101. And don't you ever do that with your wife, okay? Remember what I was talking to you about this morning. So I leave. Now, she's furious. But she turns her fury the right direction. And she starts running through the house, speaking furniture all over the house. Now, I'm not kidding. I come back from the service, and the whole house is light. And I said, what, 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 what happened in here? She goes, I spoke furniture all over this house. Let me tell you about it. Come with me. There is a blue and white striped couch right there. There will be a chaise lounge right there. There is a Monet print right there. And she starts walking and tells me about all the furniture she's just spoken in the house. Okay? I'm not kidding you. I watched in five months that whole house get filled with exactly what she said. I was amazed. Okay? So now, now... A couple months later, my pastor walks into a meeting. Now you have to understand, there's 11 of us pastors on staff, and he walks into this meeting, and he looks at all of us 11 pastors, he said, gentlemen and lady, he said, I had a vision last night. I literally watched this vision like you're watching a TV program. He said, in my vision, God showed me one of you is gonna be traveling. You're gonna go out and come back, and out and come back, and out and come back, and you're gonna be a great blessing in the body of Christ. He said, that man is you, John Bevere. When he said that, the Spirit of God falls on me, and I start weeping. I said, Pastor, God showed me that four months ago, and I didn't tell anybody, just my wife and a guy in another state. He said, well, God showed me, John. He said, so this is what we're going to do. Now, this is August of 1989. He said, we're going to pay your salary the rest of the year. He said, I want you to start building your traveling ministry. You can go out as much as you want the rest of this fall, and then come December 31st, we're going to stop your salary, and you'll be on your own starting January 1, 1990. I said, thank you so much. So I traveled to a couple places that fall, but who in the world knows who John Bevere is? Nobody. So we come to the beginning of November. I have two meetings that are booked after January 1. 
The first meeting, the first week of January, meets in a funeral home in Sumter, South Carolina with 70 members. And the second meeting was at the end of February at a little church in the hills of Tennessee. And that's it. And I have $300 to my name. I have two little mouths to feed. And I have a wife. And I have a, 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 a small car payment and a small house payment. And I have $300 in my name. Now, well, my pastor started getting nervous. He's like, what have I done? So he gives me, my pastor's world renowned. If I said his name, everybody in here would know him. So he gives me 600 churches that he himself had spoken at and a letter of recommendation that was off the charts. He said, here you go, John. Do whatever you want with this. So what do I do? I get his letters, I copy them, I write a letter, I get his stationery, and I start addressing the 600 ad addresses on these letters, right? And I get to about the 40th envelope, and the Holy Spirit speaks to me. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm letting pastors know I'm available to come preach. He said, you'll get out of my will. I said, God, nobody knows me out there. He said, I know you, trust me. So I look at these 40 envelopes, I thought, either I'm crazy or I'm hearing from God. I tear them up and throw them away. Now we come to the end of December. My salary's being cut next week. My pastor's really nervous because I still only have the funeral home the first week of January and the little church in the hills of Tennessee at the end of February. That's it. And my pastor comes up to us and he says, Lisa, you have television producing in your background. I want to hire you to be the producer of my TV program. I will pay you $46 an hour. Oh, my goodness, $46 an hour. We're like, wow. And then he looks at me. He says, I'm going to put you in, up, John, in front of national TV. I'm going to tell pastors all over the country they need to have you in their church. And he said, we're going to give you monthly support. He said, that way you can build up your traveling ministry. I said, Pastor, thank you, God. You have come through the midnight hour. I am so grateful. So I go out praying two nights later. God speaks to me. He said, if your wife accepts the job of producing your pastor's program, he said, whatever he pays her, the $46 an hour, I will deduct it from offerings on the road because I want your wife by your side. I thought, okay, there goes the $46 an hour job. <laughs> then the Lord says to me, your pastor will not get you up in front of national TV. He will not announce you and he will not give you monthly support. I said, why not? He told me he would. <laughs> and this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, he won't because I won't let him and he'll listen to me. I said, why won't you let him? <laughs> and the Lord said this to me. He said, because when you get out there and you get in trouble, you'll run to him and not to me. He said, I don't want that. I want you running to me. So, first year of traveling. Not kidding. The entire ministry income for the entire year was $40,000. That had to pay my salary and run the ministry. We literally saw days that God met our house payment the day it was due without anybody knowing we needed it. It was amazing. Okay? Now that's 1990. Let me go, for, let me go forward now 24 years to 2014. Today, because of the 3 million resources we're giving to pastors in almost 60 nations this year, because of the buildings we built in Cambodia and, and the work we're doing in Thailand and India for the sex trafficked girls, because of 30 employees, we need $130,000 a week. Okay, I didn't say a month, I said a week, and we don't have a congregation, okay? Now, can I tell you something? It is so easy to believe God for that $130,000 a week. Matter of fact, I've never lost not even 10 seconds of sleep over that $130,000 a week. Now, here's my whole point. What if I would have had to believe God for $130,000 a week in 1990 when we were first launched? You know what it would have been like? It would have been like Kip putting 225 on the bar the first time in the gym. The weight would have come down and killed me. What is routine for Lisa and I today would have killed us back in 1990. Because God will never let you face anything. He knows you don't have the power to overcome it. You see, the Holy Spirit is like the weightlifting coach. That weightlifting coach didn't put 405 on the bar because he knew it would have killed me. But he knew I could handle 315. He knew what I could handle more than I knew what I could handle. 
Now, here is the problem. And I have preached all night to get to this point. And if you miss this point, I have put out a lot of energy tonight for nothing. So please listen to the next five minutes. How many of you know God knows your end from the beginning? All right? You're in a place right now, whether it's in the marketplace, whether it's in educational field, the medical field, the athletic field, the ministry, you're in a position that carries influence. You're impacting people's lives for the kingdom of God. You're impacting people Jim and Debbie could never impact, right? And your position carries 145 pounds of opposition. But God has a new position he wants to put you in shortly. This new position is going to impact a whole lot more people. It's going to influence so many more for the kingdom of God. But it carries 185 pounds of opposition. But you're only at 145. So you know what God does? He allows. He doesn't author. He doesn't instigate. He permits a 155 attack to come against you. Somebody maliciously gossips about you at work. What do you do? Rather than doing what the word of God says and blessing those who curse you. You put a nice smile on your face and you, with your passive aggressive Christian way, gossip back about them. God goes back to 145. So then he allows another attack. 155. He doesn't author it, doesn't instigate it, but he permits another 155 attack. This time it's in the financial realm, like I just went through with you, with Lisa and I. But you don't have to pray and fight. Our credit rating's not exhausted. Just put down the plastic. God goes back to 145. He permits another 155 attack. You use your manipulative techniques to get out of that one. Back to 145. But the problem is, the time has now come that he needs you in that 185 position, but you're still at 145. And because he will never allow you to face anything you don't have the power to overcome, he has to now put somebody else in that 185 position that he originally intended for you. So this is what I want to ask. How many of us are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ? You know where Jesus examines us as believers? Okay? There's two judgment seats. One's for the sinners. One's for the believers. The believers, we don't get judged for our sins. Our sins have been eradicated. But we are going to be judged on how we lived as Christians. And at that judgment seat, Jesus is going to be weeping because I believe there's tears in this judgment seat. I believe he's going to weep more than any of us because he wants to reward us because he loves us so much. And tears are going to be coming down his cheek as he looks at us and says, let me show you the positions of influence that would have impacted people for my kingdom, that would have built it so much greater, that I had planned for you, but I couldn't put you in those positions because you kept resisting your endurance training. You know, with David, it started out with a bear. Then it was a lion. And then it was Goliath. If David would have bypassed the bear and bypassed the lion, when Goliath came out, he would have acted just like his brothers. And God would have had to get somebody else, so you would have had King Steve. <laughs> Not King David. I have been going to the gym for 20 years now. And I have never once seen anybody in the gym go, I can't! Believe I got to lift 225 today. Why can't I just have a normal life? Are you kidding? They see it as an opportunity because 225 is the road to 245 is the road to 265. Amen. We have got the wrong perspective on adversity if we would just see it as an athlete. Why do you think Paul said, I buffet my body? <laughs> Comparing it to athletics. James goes on to say, and I'll wrap it up because I've gone long enough. James goes on to say, so let 
it grow. What's it? Your capacity, your endurance. For when your endurance, your capacity is fully developed, watch this, you will be perfect. Do you see this? You will be complete and you will need nothing. Now, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. We got to discuss this. There's a church in the Bible, in the book of Revelations. You know what this church said? We're blessed. We're prosperous. We need nothing. And Jesus comes along and says to this church, oh, you think you're blessed? You think you're prosperous? Let me tell you your real condition. You're wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. That's really scary when you think you're so blessed you need nothing. And Jesus comes along and says, you're wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. This isn't the case. God says if you go through his endurance training, if you handle it, these challenges correctly, he said, you will be perfect. This is God speaking. You will be perfect. You will be complete. And you will need nothing. What am I talking to you about? I am talking to you about a relentless believer. What does the word relentless mean? It means this. An attitude or a posture that is resolute. Persistent and unyielding. Simply put, it does not relent. What does it mean to relent? To relent means to become more lenient, to slacken, or even concede. What should be our mindset now? Our paradigm when we face adversity? This is what we should really be thinking. How exciting! <laughs> this is not an obstacle. It's an opportunity. I'm going to get through this, and I'm going to be stronger on the other side. My capacity level is about to grow. I'm on my way to another level of power and authority. I will be much more effective. What a privilege. Did you get something out of this tonight? I want every head bowed. I want every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, I preach what you commanded me to preach tonight. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, again for what you've done. Now, Lord, I'm asking that you would complete what you've begun. I want to ask you first, with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. You're sitting in here tonight and you say, John, I'm a believer, I'm a child of God, but I've had the complete, total wrong attitude. I've had the wrong paradigm. I'm really more the one that goes, why me? Why do I have to go through this? Why can't I just have a normal life? And after hearing the word of God tonight, I want to repent of this attitude. I want to ask God for a clean start. I want to ask God that he would change my paradigm, that I would be an armed believer. If that's you, I want you to put up your hands right now if, I, if I'm talking to you. Just put them up high. Don't be ashamed. Don't be scared. I'm not going to embarrass anybody. Man, look at all these hands going up. Say, so John, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just fed up with, with my attitude. I'm ready to face this as an opportunity. Put up your hands high. Come on. Don't leave them up. Don't leave them down. If you, if, if you say, man, let me just put it to you this way. If you got convicted in this message tonight, your hand should be up. Okay? I'll help you there. Probably looking at 60% of the hands in the building are up. Put them down. The most important thing I want to do tonight is you can never stand against adversity like I've just talked to you about tonight unless you're a child of God. Not everybody is a child of God. You have to understand this. <laughs> Matter of fact, the only people that are children of God who have made the decision to give their entire life to Jesus. You have to understand you were born a slave, a slave of sin. Yeah, that's right. I was born a slave of sin. There's not a human being on the face of, the third, of this earth that it was not born a slave. That's why God sent us a savior. Jesus came to get us out of slavery. But you see, even though Jesus died on the cross, even though he paid the price to get us out of slavery, you have to make the decision to walk out of it and to give him the lordship of your life. I want you to see it like this. A king comes. Your great-great-grandfather got your whole family enslaved to some evil, evil villains, some hoodlums. You've been in prison for generations, but a good king comes and battles the evil man and defeats him, and he throws open the gates, throws open the gates, and says, all you prisoners are free, but you've got to make the decision to get up and walk out. And if you walk out, that means you're going to follow that king onto his ship, and you're going to go back to his land. You're going to live by his laws. You're going to live by his ways. But you see, the king will not force you to follow him because he knows he would be a tyrant just like those evil people were. So here's the deal. 
Satan, sin. They've been tyrants in people's lives. But God's not a tyrant. God says, I gave you free will. I'll never violate your right to choose, even though I've paid the price for you to spend eternity in heaven, a place far better than anything you could ever imagine. I've gotten you out of hell. There's a real hell. I have people I know personally that have been to hell. A doctor friend of mine was an atheist. He used to spit on people's Bibles and and literally would throw them to the ground and stomp on them. He died on an operating table, the top surgeon in the state of Oklahoma. And two times that night, he went to hell. He said, John, I've never experienced that kind of fear. Never, never. He said, the fear kept getting worse the lower I went. He said, I kept descending into the earth. And he said, then I heard the flames and heard this, or saw the flames and heard the screams. And he said, a being grabbed me by the shoulder and began to pull me in. And he said, heaven spoke and said, let him go. And the being said, no, he's mine. And the heaven spoke again and said, let him go. And he said, I came back. And he said, John, I got saved. And you know, he's alive today without a pancreas. And he takes no insulin. He's a walking miracle. Because there's a real hell. And Jesus came because he loves you so much to get you out of that place. But you have to make the choice. You have to say, Jesus, I'm going to give my life to you. Just like a girl has got to make a decision to give her life to a man that she's going to marry. Because when she walks down the aisle with that white dress, she's saying goodbye to every male in the human race except for that one guy that's waiting for her. She's saying, I'm giving my life to you. She had to choose that. You see, even though Jesus loves you, and he came and he died and he paid the price to get you out of that hell I just described, he'll not violate your will. If you want to stay a slave of sin, he'll, he won't force you to follow him. So if you're sitting here tonight and you'd say, John, I've never given him the ownership of my life. And I want to do it. Then I want to give you an opportunity tonight. I want you to be honest. See, the one thing I'm asking of you is this. Just make a decision. If you say, you know what? I don't want to go to heaven. I want to burn in that hell fire forever. God will respect your right to choose. A good friend of mine who's an evangelist, he pleaded with a young man one night three times in a service. He said, John, I felt, he, he, he felt drawn to this young man. Three times. And the third time, he actually got down on his knees in the service and said, please, would you give your life to Jesus? The young man said, no, I got a life to live. The young man got on his motorcycle. This is my friend. I know, I know him. And he was killed on a motorcycle wreck that night after that service. Do you know God reached out to him three times through my friend? But he thought, I got a life to live. So I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you a chance tonight because God wants you to have that chance. He's gonna keep giving you chances. But you know what? You're not promised tomorrow if you're not a believer. Tomorrow may not come. That guy, that young man, he thought he had tomorrow. But his life was taken that night on an accident. So if you're in here tonight and you say, John, I want to receive Jesus. I want to give him my life. Man, that's a good choice. I'm going to help you do it. I'm going to count to three. And when I do, I'm going to clap my hand just like that. And when I clap my hand, I want you to shoot your hand up if you say, man, I want Jesus. And I want you to keep your hand up. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. I'm going to count starting right now. One, I hope you make the decision. Two, three, lift your hand. Whoa, must be 40 hands up in the air right now. Keep your hand up. Don't be afraid. Now listen, this is what I want everyone to do. I want you to stand to your feet. Every person, stand to your feet. Every person in this building. There was about 40 hands that went up in the air. Now listen, listen to me, listen. I'm not done. When they crucified Jesus, they crucified him naked. Yeah, I know the Catholic Church put a loincloth around the crucifix. No, they they publicly humiliated him and he did it for you. The only thing he asks is that you will confess him before men. So there's about 40 of you that raised your hands. I want to shake your hand. I don't want to welcome you into the kingdom. So this is what we're going to do. I'm, I'm just going to ask you in just a minute to get, step out of your seat. I want you to grab what you brought. I want you to even bring the person you might have come with. I want you to slip out to the aisle. That's why I had everybody stand, make it really easy for you. And I want you to come down here and I want to shake your hand because we're going to pray for you to receive Jesus. So folks, 
my dear friends, can you give these people a hand as they start coming right now? Come on down. Come on. Come on. I want to shake your hand. Come on. Are you here? No, you're the, no. You. I didn't recognize you without your jacket. Hey, how are you? Hey, how you doing? How are you? Hi, guys. How are you? Good. Come on. So cute. Hey, man. How you doing? What's your name? So, so good to meet you, buddy. Hey, how are you? How are you? Hey, buddy. How you doing? Good. Hey, how you doing? Man, you're a good-looking kid. You're a good-looking kid. Too bad. Hey, man, how you doing? Hey, how are you? How are you? How are you, sir? How are you? Hey there. How are you doing? Boy, those are cute glasses you got on. Hello there. Hello. How are you? Hello there. Hello. Come on down. Come on. Come on. Give him a hand. Nice to see you. How are you? Hello there. Hey. Oh, I've met you guys. Yep. Hey. How exciting. Hi, guys. How do you say hello to you? Hey. How are you? Hey. How are you, sir? How are you? Man, you look good. Look at all these good-looking people. Hello there. Hey, how are you? Hey, hey. You're up here helping? Thanks. Hey, come on, let's give them a big hand. You know what? I'm so happy because you all are smiling. This is the best decision you've ever made. You know what happened to me? 30, 35 years ago, I made this decision in my college fraternity. Yeah, my fraternity brother led me to the Lord, right? So I go home. I said, Mom, I've received Jesus. I'm a Christian. Mom, you know what she said to me? She said, ah, oh, this is what she said. This is one of your fads, John. You'll quit this like you quit everything else. Now, the thing was, she was right. I quit everything else. And I just said to my mom, I said, Mom, this is real. I mean, I, I've been changed. And she said, okay. I said, I said, just watch. 35 years later, she's in the fad. She gives my books away now. Because what is about to happen to Unite is so real. You're literally about to become my brother in Christ. You're about to become a child of God, my sister in Christ. You're about to become a child of God. And so I've got Pastor Joel here, the good looking dude with the leathers on, okay? He is gonna take you right over there and he is gonna just share a few more things with you and then he's gonna pray with you. And you will be back out here before we are out of here. But the cool thing is he's gonna give you a gift. I like that. I'd really like to go with you to get the gift. But anyway, he's going to lead you out. And can we give them a huge hand as he takes them out? I'm so proud of you, Joe. Come on. Yes. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow, you repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.